ministry gift. Me? Like, really? My name is Larry Jones, and I do welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus. This is an extension of the last video released the previous Saturday evening. I release a video teaching every Saturday. I have more to say about the subject of ministry gifts as listed in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Several years ago, I was handed a handful of audio tapes by Derek Prince, 1915-2003. Author of some 50 books, some of which have been translated into many languages, Prince was one of the five founders of what became known as the Shepherding Movement. Their discipleship teachings reached my city of Kelowna in the mid-1970s, greatly and negatively influencing our People of Faith prayer group, as well as hundreds and perhaps thousands of other prayer groups in North America and beyond. Our People of Faith group gathered Thursday evenings in St. Teresa's Catholic Church. Those gatherings of about 70 or more were awesome. I can see the steeple of St. Teresa's Church from my office window as I write these words, reminding me of the astounding Holy Spirit meetings we had. The teachings of the shepherding movement were very disruptive. Soon everyone was talking headship and submission to authority and group discernment. Originally, the emphasis of those roused Catholic hearts was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But that changed rapidly with the introduction of these false teachers and teachings. The emphasis swung from Jesus unto Christian leadership, just like evangelicalism. There are lessons to be learned from all this. We think that big is better. Got to form a core group, equivalent to a board of elders. Got to have connections to other groups. Got to have conferences. Got to have imported teachers. Got to organize. And yet the more born-again Catholic Christians did to improve that which was birthed by the Holy Spirit, the less the Holy Spirit involved himself. It's like the Holy Spirit said, okay, you want to run the show? Go ahead. I'll stand back and watch. Simplicity is much more productive and peaceful than complexity. To return to first love, the repentant heart must forego the complicated and embrace the simple. Simplicity is simply developing and preserving a one-to-one -one devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings me back to Derek Prince. Prince had publicly repented of the excesses of the shepherd movement. One of the audio tapes loaned to me about five years ago focused on his later understanding of the Ephesians 4.11 ministry gifts. Insights that made a powerful impact on me. Let me tell you why. You see, I could not understand how evangelical pulpit people who seem to mimic the Catholic, Anglican, United Church, and other Orthodox pulpit people could justify the division of Christ's church into two classes. One, what the more Orthodox churches call the clergy, and evangelical churches called the ministerial, and second, the laity or layman, or what I simply call pulpit people and pew people, or the salaried and the non-salaried. The only possible justification for this division of Christ's church seemed to be Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, which says, some, not all, are called to be apostles, and some, not all, are called to be prophets, and some, not all, are called to be evangelists, and some, not all, are called to be pastors and teachers. Doesn't the word some exclude most others? Doesn't some mean that only a select number, probably a few, are given a ministry gift, and therefore those few could be in a class by themselves? Though this contravenes the words of Jesus, you are equal as brothers and sisters, this is how most understand Ephesians 4.11. But consider, who taught us 
this questionable explanation of this verse. Pulpit people, right? But Derek Prince, as he expressed in the said audio tape, strongly disagrees. Paul's usage of the word some does not exempt anybody. Indeed, the gifts listed in Ephesians 4 and 11 definitely includes everyone. Since listening to Prince's logic, I scrutinized Ephesians 4 verses 7 to 16 several times over the years. Suppose you read this report in your local newspaper. The Vegetarians Club had a picnic. Some brought carrots, and some brought lettuce. Some brought peppers, and some brought peas, and some brought celery. You would assume, I would think, that everybody brought something. No, not everybody brought carrots, and not everybody brought lettuce, and not everybody brought peppers, etc., but everybody brought something. Or you read this report. A grandfather with a serious ailment had dozens of grandchildren, and decided to give them money before he passed away. To some, he gave $1,000. To some, he gave $2,000. To some, he gave $5,000. To some, he gave ten, dollars And some, $20,000. Why would the reader assume that only some grandchildren got money? Why wouldn't the reader assume all, not some, of the grandkids received money? Now transpose that logic onto Ephesians 4.11. Why would anyone assume that not all Ephesian Christians received one of the gifts? Especially since the verses preceding and following Ephesians 4.11 definitely include every Christian. Now I want you to consider one of your friends, any friend who is uncommonly enthusiastic about God. Chances are you can see one of the five ministry gifts in that person. Perhaps he has an unusual concern for the unsaved, the sign of an evangelist, perhaps. She is particularly concerned for the welfare of newborn Christians, a suggestion she has the gift of pastor. Perhaps he has a burden to bring Christ to the nations, a possible clue that he has the calling of apostle. Perhaps she has an unusual ability to supernaturally discern the direction of the Lord or a warning of a future event. Prophet. Perhaps he has a propensity and ability to communicate God's truth. Teacher. Everyone has a, an Ephesians 4.11 gifting. Though some have a more powerful anointing upon his gift, and usually this gift is quite discernible. So why don't pulpit people teach pew people that they do have an Ephesians 4.11 gift? It is obvious to me that the salaried, those in control of local congregations and those in control of denominations, do not want Ephesians 4.11 to include everyone. That would spoil Everything that would delegitimize the notion of a two-tiered Christianity that would make pastor whoever much less relevant. How could they justify their paycheck if everyone was gifted and allowed to exercise their gifts? How could they be considered special if all are special? If Derek Prince was right, millions of pastor whoever's are wrong. Millions of reverends are proven to not be so worthy of special reverence. Evangelicalism would have again proven itself to be wanting and unworthy to be funded. Evangelicalism only thrives because it rises from Christ's great commission to reach the world with the gospel. Those ornate buildings scattered throughout your city and all those salary pastors cost more than millions of dollars. They cost millions of of souls. Having said all that, our focus shouldn't be on the Ephesians 4 and 11 gifts, but rather the gifts giver, the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus sent to each born-again believer the Spirit of truth to lead us into all truth. We must learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit who strongly desires to glorify Lord Jesus through us. We must get our priorities straight John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8, 
that speaks of Christ in the vine and us the branches is much more relevant and helpful than Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 16. If we manage a firm connection to Christ the vine, we will be fruitful. If we don't get that right, our Christianity will be feeble and no strategy will improve it. Some imagine a Reformed church as one whereby pastor whoever must share the pulpit with apostle whoever and prophet whoever and evangelist whoever and teacher whoever. They imagine five men lined up at the front of the sanctuary like ducks on a shooting gallery awaiting their turn to preach. The Holy Spirit does not, cannot do his work under such man-made gridlock. Christians do not dictate to the Holy Spirit. If man insists on governing, the Holy Spirit will stand back. Perhaps he will say, okay, you want to run the show? Go ahead. I'll stand back and watch. May you and I pursue Christ diligently. Diligently.